macro view is pretty scary. I'm very bearish. I, the global economy, you know, we don't even know yet how many things broke in the dark in the night when the governments shut down the engine of the world last year. And if I'm that right that the markets are over pricing in a hawkish Fed, it's actually near-term bullish. You know, there, and no if you're looking at a commodity super cycle, which I think we are, you know, that's bullish for all of these things. And you have I did not make money on those coins. I, I got money that I couldn't have gotten any other way. And, and the funny part of the story is that they were old Mexican silver pesos that had a little bit of silver in them. They were not solid silver. Um, and Mexico and peso had been devalued three or four times with numbers of zeros chopped off. If I had pesos in a bank, right, you know, my, my 1960 peso would be completely worthless. Welcome back to risk everyone. I'm Lee and I, I have a great guest, uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Lobo Tigre. Lobo, how you been? All right. Thinking about risk and happy to be on the show. Certainly been a risky time to, to be in the markets, uh, pretty much any market you've been in. Now you're known for trading precious metals and, and mining stocks. Do you dabble in other markets? Not really. I keep saying, you know, I'm a speculator in theory. If I see a great speculation anywhere, I'm interested in, but I keep finding that if I you know, the farther I get from what I know, the more uncertain I am about the speculation and the more reluctant I am to make it. In, in my personal life, it's pretty much real estate. Outside of the metals and mining, it's just real estate because that's pretty straightforward for me to understand. You know, maybe at some point I'll find the, the, the wildest DeFi stock out there that really convinces me it's the future and I'm going to pile in. I just haven't found it in myself to be persuaded that, yes, I know this is the next Amazon of whatever. Now, uh, real estate, are you in habitational or commercial? or both? Habitational. I'm not terribly interested in being in the landlord. You know, if I found something that I could buy and then sell, I thought it would have undervalued, appreciated. So it's been entirely residential so far, including in far off places like the, the Republic of Belarus. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, it's pretty far off. I mean, how do, how do you do a deal all the way over there? I mean, do you have uh, local people there? Or? You may or may not know my hobby for the last 20 years or so has been teaching economics and entrepreneurship in Eastern Europe. So I have hundreds of former students nice. around that part of the world and they all know what I do and what I'm interested in. And so it's the sort of thing that you would never have seen in the classified ads, but a student knew of somebody in their village who had this property that was literally in front of the front gate of this ancient castle that was being renovated. And so I was able to pick up this property for peanuts. It kind of reminds me of Doug Casey's famous story about his castle in Zimbabwe, this dilapidated shack falling down. And then now they've renovated this castle. It's a major tourist attraction, the biggest thing outside of Minsk. <laughs> and this thing was right in front of it. Story. So, I mean, just the background of how you got there and what you did. And now, are you renting that or, or did you sell it? What, no, what did you do with that property? sold it. Well, I wanted to build like a a b and b or something there, maybe. Uh, but the village had all these rules for what you could build and what you couldn't build. And it had to be a traditional village house. I could, you know, I, I'd really, honestly, I didn't know entirely what I was getting into when I got in. But I found some Russians who were quite willing to go up and fight against City Hall there where I wasn't. And so I sold it to them, doubled the money. But uh, <laughs> Probably more valuable were the lessons learned about getting in over my head a bit there. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, that, that takes you back to what you were saying, tra trade what you know, right? Exactly. Do you have any outlook on the near-term gold and silver price? Well, if I'm right that the markets are overpricing in a hawkish Fed, it's actually near-term bullish. You know, there, There's been a lot of waffling. They've been under a lot of pressure. And yet, at the same time, inflation is high, persistently high. And you know, in the most asinine inversion I've seen on the markets since COVID-19, traders are treating high inflation as bad for gold and silver. That's crazy. It's wrong. Either that or I'm wrong. But if I'm right, that error has to correct. And one of the things that would help would be the Fed not being as hawkish as people expect. You know, the, the reason for this crazy inversion is that everybody says, oh, high inflation, the Fed's got to fight that. And that means raising rates, which is bad for gold and silver. But that's simply not true. Like historically, you look back, if uh, um, inflation is higher than the rates rises, your, your real rate is going more deeply negative. In 2004, 2005 was a really good example of this, where the Fed was hiking rates and gold was going up. Why? Because real rates were going south faster than the Fed was raising rates. That's actually my base case expectation here. Even if the Fed does come around to raising rates sometime next year, I think inflation will be high higher than those rates. I think we'll still be in negative rates. I think it will not be anywhere near as hawkish as people are expecting. And I think that will be bullish for gold and silver.
we could see a taste of that tomorrow. There's there's a bold and wild and crazy prediction. No, I'm not predicting that. I said could. I I'm, hold, say I'm will. holding you to that one there, Lobo. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't say go out and, and you know get a triple third mortgage. You know, bet the farm on this. Uh, but it, it'll be interesting if I'm right. We should see as as the Fed fails to be as hawkish as people expect, I think that crazy inversion of, of high inflation is somehow bad for gold. I think that goes away over time. So you've been, you were bullish on copper. Now, now I think you're, you're kind of pulling back on that because you, you think it's uh, slightly overvalued or... No, no, just but it rose so vertically so quickly. Anytime you see something like that, some form of correction and consolidation is likely. And we still have the headwinds of the various COVID-19 mutations and so on. And whatever you think about the medical facts, people always want to beat me up. There's no such thing as a virus. Or don't you know this is the end of the no, world? No, you know, I can't is, say this anything I, on this. This is stuff. one thing I really like about you. Lobo, you're very realistic in your outlook. You, you, you don't you follow any economic religious view. I mean, I'm myself as well. You, you just have to look at what reality is at the moment. It doesn't matter what is real, what's not. It's all perception is reality and you got to trade accordingly, correct? But that's just it. It's not just our perception. You, you, know, you or I or any member of the audience may have a different perception of, you know, the vaccines and all this stuff. That's not the point. The point is that policymakers, you know, they have a very predictable perception and they kind of have to do what they have to do because they're pandering for votes. And so I'm not going to predict medically what's going to happen next. I'm quite happy to predict that if there's a new mutation, the government's going to react strongly with more shutdowns, lockdowns, travel restrictions. That's exactly what we saw with Omicron, even though it seems to be more benign. And, and maybe that blessing in disguise. I, yeah, let's set that aside. So I hope hope the audience you've gathered appreciates that. You know, we, we can't talk about these things without addressing controversial issues. The point is that until the COVID-19 situation is well and truly behind us, it's reasonable to expect more uh, government responses that have economic consequences that are going to be crappy for industrial metal. And it's, that's, it is bearish. It's just flat out bearish when you shut down any part of the economy or you shut down travel and so on. So you've got a combination of high prices and reasons to expect headwinds. So of course, it's it's reasonable to not, not abandon the trade, but look for consolidation correction, look for profit taking opportunities or hold on to your dry powder to look for buying opportunities. You know, one thing I'd like to add into that mix, we've been pretty bullish just as, as a group on, on copper and metals. And part of the, the rationale for that has been the greening of the economy. And, and I know the United Nations through sustainable development and their whole Agenda 21 thing have really been pushing this globally. But recently we've seen California starting to cut back on rebates and things like that, or at least talking about them on solar, installing solar panels on the roofs and et cetera. So if that trend changes, what happens to this commodity super cycle that we've been living through? But clearly the disappearance of a headwind, you know, let's say it goes away entirely, which isn't going to happen, but let's say it goes away entirely. It's still Dr. Cop. It's still an industrial metal that's essential to so many applications. And, and yes, at very high prices, you can substitute aluminum and some, but, but really not a lot. Copper has unique chemical properties as all 92 naturally curling elements do, including gold. So it's still an essential industrial metal. So without the the green agenda, it still would have to go up in a commodity super cycle. It's still going to respond to high inflation the way everything else does. But I don't think the green story goes away. I think governments run into budgetary limits. There's, you know, whatever they can do. But you know, if they can't give you money for an incentive, doesn't mean they can't regulate that you're going to ban internal combustion engines. Oh, let's move it up. Forget 2040. Let's do 2030. Oh, no, we're all going to die in five years. Let's make it 2025 or something, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, I just I think that is a tailwind that we're going to enjoy, if you want to call it that, you know, and don't beat me up about saying, oh, well, the, you know, EVs are crap and they wouldn't survive without government. Well, subsidies. Once again, we get back to the perception of reality for right. You know, the government subsidies are there. OK, yeah, maybe they shouldn't be there, but they are, you know, as an investor, as a speculator, I'm looking at what is not the ideal libertarian world that I wish had, you know, existed with zero government intervention. You know, personally, I believe in separation of economy and state for very similar reasons as church and state. And even, by the way, perhaps especially education and state. But it is what it is right now. 
And we're trying to make money in this world. And in this world, governments all around the planet are pushing this. They're going to have their way. The people support this on average. So that's the trend, you know, make the trend your friend. And to address very specifically, nickel, for example, not just copper, nickel goes into these things. They're, they're working to replace it, but still there. But still the primary consumption, the latest Woodmac report has primary consumption for nickel is still going to be steel making for years and years and years to come. So if the whole green story goes away, you're still going to need nickel for making steel. That doesn't change. And if you're looking at a commodity super cycle, which I think we are, you know, that's bullish for all of these things. Do you have any idea of how long a commodity super cycle will last? I mean, are, I know you refer back to the 70s quite often. Yeah. And Lynn, uh, Lynn Alden, who's mentoring me now <laughs> on, on the macro view, um, is, is fond of pointing to the 40s. And these things tend to be sort of decade long waves is the way I see it. And if you look at the magnitude of the money, printing that's been done and what's still likely to be done and the the new perception now that hey maybe maybe completely globalized supply chains aren't an entirely good they're, they're not anti-fragile right no i think companies are going to embrace higher costs to harden their supply chains at least a little right they're, they're right. i think to go all american vertically integrated from top to bottom and produce a product that's three or four times more expensive than something produced on the global stage that's not going to work but no. everybody sees that vulnerability now and i think companies will embrace higher costs and that will be passed on to consumers and that that's actually good news for miners and anybody who supplies raw materials to this machine. Well, that, that brings us to the, the news this morning. I mean, uh, today is a Tuesday, December 14th. We had the PPI print this morning. It was almost 10%. And, yeah. And I, <laughs> I, I was thinking about this. If you were getting 10% on your money right now, you'd be thrilled to death. Well, but, you know, that's a, that's a cost. That's not a, that's oh, not well, I know. I'm flipping not a payout. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay. But this actually fits into something I get asked a lot is, oh, well, you know, oil and energy is up and your steel for your trucks and all that stuff is up. So all these costs are up, you know, isn't that bearish for the miners? But this is part of the whole idea of the commodity super cycle is that even gold and silver, even the monetary metals, they correlate very highly with the rest of the commodities and metals. And so you have these things tend to move together. So yes, higher costs, higher inputs are bad for you as a miner. But at the same time, that same force that's making your costs higher tends to make your product higher. Yeah. So net net, it depends on which one is moving faster for you. And basically, I'm not saying don't worry about it. I'm saying these things balance out. Don't leap to conclusions. You know, I have seen people uh, prune their portfolios of anybody that's running gen sets, for example, you know, they're off the grid, they're burning diesel to power their mine. And and oil prices are higher. So we're going to, we're going to get rid of everybody who's vulnerable to this weakness of higher up and then nothing happens, right? You know, or, you know, the metals prices go up enough that they can run those gen sets, even at higher energy or last year, you get, you know, $35 a barrel oil prices. Things rarely seem to be as cookie cutter as a, a simple model like that scares people into thinking. That is kind of silly because all miners use equivalent amounts of energy, don't they? Yeah. I, I don't know if you, how far you want to go down the rabbit hole, but yes, it's very energy intensive. There is a move now to make the fleets greener, you know, go with electric trucks and so on, hydro or something. Right. And, and, and you don't get to choose where the deposit is. If you are so lucky as to have a deposit next to Quebec Hydro, great. But everybody else, the, the mine is where it is. Of course. The only way you move it is by producing it. I mean, generally speaking, most of these mines are not next to hydroelectric power plants or any other kind of... Uh, though, though infrastructure can come to you. I remember for a while, early in my career, people were, were they were sort of once bitten, twice shy by previous governments in the Yukon territory. And then there was also just infrastructure, lack of infrastructure. But the problem has changed a lot. And even just in the 20 years I've been in the business, it's it's not this impossible remote place that you can't do businesses. And also even, you know, parts of BC, the, the Golden Triangle, there's highways and power lines where there didn't used to be. And that changes the economics of these things. So it's it's not a static picture, but but yes, mm -hmm. I don't know how far this, this rabbit hole you want to go, but, uh, you know, I've, I've been having a, somewhat of an argument on Twitter with people. I posted something about the undersea mining. There's a lot of scare going on about undersea mining is going to destroy the ocean. It's going to destroy all life on earth because it's going to destroy the ocean and all the habitat. I think undersea mining is possibly the most benign form of mining possible on the planet right now. Basically, you go to an underwater desert, you look at the pictures of these places, and you're going to dredge sand. There's no chemicals. It's just a, a long vacuum cleaner with a, with, a, with a rotary thing on the end. You scoop up some sand, and okay, yes, it stirs up silt. But it was already there. 
And okay, maybe there's a few mollusks that get moved around. I'm not saying there's no impact, but you look at these places and it's and it's almost lifeless. You know, they're not talking about mining some coral reef somewhere. Right, right, yeah. They're talking about a stretch of sand and, you know, no chemicals. All that gets taken care of on a plant elsewhere and the sand settles down. And I, I would argue I, so that the sand gets ruffled up much more when a tsunami hits or, or something along those lines than it would under mining. I, I'm not an oceanologist and, <laughs> and people say, oh, what do you know? You're not an expert. Well, OK, I've been looking at mining and you look at the point of departure here. You said all mining is energy intensive. Yes, it is. All mining is disruptive. Yes, it is. Unless you want to live in the Stone Age, we need mining. So what's the most benign form of mining we can get? And it seems to me that simply sifting through sand on the bottom of the ocean is a heck of a lot more benign than, you know, blasting sulfide veins that you have to worry about producing acid mine drainage or having tailings dams that can fail and things like that. You know, mining has risk. I've never been the sort of person that says, oh, there's no harm done. Of course, there's harm. What kind of uh, mining, mining supplier reserves would be under the sea, do you think? I mean, do you, do you think it puts us on a whole well, other level? That's the other thing. This most recent report is like, oh, the you know, the this one, the richest deposit in the world is this one place that's so fragile. Well, in the first place, every environmentalist did with their pet, pet peeve, that's the most fragile place in the world. It doesn't matter if some barren hill in the middle of the, you know, Gobi Desert or some grass tuft in Ireland that's no different from that other grass tuft. Oh, no, this is the most pristine, most special place right. in the world. But it's just barely begun. This is an idea that hasn't actually happened yet in commercial application, you know, and, you know, the, the ocean floor is vast. Yeah, and well, well my, my thought along these lines was that perhaps there's huge reserves out there and that's not good for the I think so. I, I think so. And, and you don't have to mine the black smoker itself. You're looking for a paleo black smoker. You're for, looking for a former black smoker uh, that's left all this stuff right on the surface where you can scoop it up. So, so yes, I think it's a, a huge opportunity. Talk about risk, though. It's just one of those things where the world is perverse, right? This seems to me to be amongst, if not the most benign form of mining possible, but it's going to be the most protested you're gonna have greenpeace showing up and harassing these ships wherever they go it's easy it's photogenic uh you know i, I have actually never invested in this so i'm not talking my book here i'm not trying to sell some in some stock i own i've never gone there because i think this is going to be a magnet for opposition well, well let, let's say it goes through and, and they find huge reserves out there i mean is, isn't that going to suppress the price of gold and silver whatever they find well people say that about the asteroid too but <laughs> well let, let's talk you know, about if, realism here you your, your your theme like what's what's realistic i think it's a lot yes. more realistic so uh, the, 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 the asteroid is is not real in in less than decades I, I if ever think, yeah i don't think that'll happen but so but ocean mining could happen but but lee it's if it happens it takes years to come if it happens it takes many years to ramp up the volume uh, you know the discovery of any one new deposit and putting into production usually doesn't change the world, at least not for the for metals. If you're talking titanium or some oddball specialty metal, one single major new mine that comes online can change that entire market. Okay. Fair, uh, fair enough. That's I mean, sort of happened in the tin space, as you may have seen from the charts, tin has gone vertical as well recently. Mm -hmm. And there's one company I won't mention by name, uh, but it has one of the highest grade uh, tin deposits in the world. And it's been a magnet. People have jumped all over this one stock. And, you know, it's okay. It's a great, exciting story. But when one company produces a large percentage of the entire world supply of a metal, you know, it's vulnerable to the next company that comes along and does the same thing. You got to manage your risk. Well, let's let's get into that now. Your, your risk management, you've been doing speculation for, for some time. How do you manage your risk? How do you choose your trades? When do you enter? When do you exit? And, and how do you get out if, if it's going against you? Several answers to that. Uh, let's start with political risk. If somebody recently asked me, you know, what balance of uh, mineral wealth versus political jurisdiction risk, you know, how do you balance those two? And my answer is, <laughs> almost binary. If a jurisdiction is high risk, I just don't go there. It's a no-fly zone for me. I don't care what the mineral endowment is. You can have the best deposit in the world. And if the kleptocrats in government there just steal it from you, that's zero value. Or worse, you know, they let you, you nice gringos, you nice Canadians come and build a nice brand new modern mine, state of the art, and then we nationalize it, right? <laughs> you know, that, that does us no good. So places with that sort of history, I'm simply not interested in. Uh, places that are taking a hard left turn, not interested in. You know, the mineral endowment gets zero. I'm completely uninterested in investing in Peru these days, for example. And I understand that the, the sombrero luminoso there doesn't control the entire government, has got opposition in Congress, but there's a lot you know, a Latin American executive can do to mess things up for miners. And we're seeing that now in Peru with uh, the government not 
dealing with protests and the protests having a better time shutting mines down and things, major mines pulling the plug because they can't operate. So that sort of thing, clear and easy risk to mitigate. You know, why I go there, oh, it's so exciting or, oh, this deposit is so high grade. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if the government won't let you mine or will steal it from you. Apart from that, then it just sort of goes down the scale of, of the riskier the jurisdiction, the bigger the discount I want. If I've got a million ounces in Ontario, in a place where there's already lots of mining, say Red Lake, it's a well-established mine jurisdiction. And I got a million ounces at gram and a half here, open pit. And I've got the same thing in Mali, same type deposit looks the same, but it's in Mali where periodically your people get shot at or Ebola breaks out or there's another coup. So far, actually, I have to say the coups in Mali have left the mining industry undisturbed. You know, there's been several right. and they haven't gone after the miners and they haven't changed the taxes or the rules on the miners. And some people say, yeah, you know, you're overreacting. It's not so bad. Well, just because the last two coups didn't do that, that doesn't mean the next guy that comes in isn't a hardcore leftist and changes everything. Yeah. So if I have these two deposits are the same, I want a deep discount for the one in Mali. Political risk is very high on your criteria. Yes, that's, that's a very clear and easy one to communicate. Other than that, I have different strategies that I use. One thing that kind of bothers a lot of people, I'll just put it out there is I'm basically uninterested myself in pre-discovery exploration. There's I understand that when you have that discovery, you know, the Lasan curve, that's where the 10 baggers are on the on the early discovery phase of the Lasan curve. Problem is nobody can predict a discovery. Not not Rick Rule and Doug Casey, my mentors, not <laughs> Eric Sprott, the billionaire. You know, none of these guys knows or gals when there's going to be discovery, you know, they have a shotgun approach, they have enough money that they can buy a lot of these things. And a lot of them like the prospect generator model, mitigate that risk. But even with that, nobody knows when there's going to be a discovery. And here's the thing, between discovery and that, that Lausanne curve, that, that 10 bagger zone, between the point of discovery, that first drill hole, that gets everybody all excited and having a measured indicated resource that you can begin advancing the feasibility, basically defining this discovery. That doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't happen with one drill hole. That happens with a whole series of drill holes that are working, right? The model, you have a theory for what you're finding, the vein or the you know, disseminated deposit and your model's working, it's predicting and your drill holes are finding it. I call that the success in progress phase. So instead of trying to get ahead of the discovery, which nobody can predict, I look when there is a discovery that's happened and has predictive value that we have success in progress. And in my mind, that's much less risky. Okay, maybe it turns my 10 bagger into a five bagger, but you know what? Five times my money is great. I am perfectly happy with higher odds on a five bagger than very long odds on a 10 bag. And you're, you're especially not giving back on the ones that don't work out. Well, I mean, nothing's perfectly safely. I mean, if, if things course, don't work out, I, there I, happens. It's, it's much more speculative and much more risky. The, I'm, I'm addressing the risk question. Right? It's much less risky when you see success in progress. Mm -hmm. And there, I, there have been times where I misidentified it. It looked like it was going gangbusters, you know, not just one or two press releases, but like three or four press releases of just boom, 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 looks great. And then suddenly the drill results peter out. They, they started and they had the bad luck of finding the best part of the deposit or zone at first. And then it's downhill from there. You know, mother nature can be a real bitch. <laughs> she loves to torture geologists. It's, I think it's her favorite thing to do. So never say never, but I think your odds of getting on the success and progress bandwagon are much better than trying to predict the next Hemlo or whatever. And by the way, there's on the website, there is a free article on this that, you know, describing and, and in providing more color on the success and progress. If you go to our independent speculator.com, forgive the plug and just search for success in the little search tool in the upper right corner, you'll find the success and progress uh, article and it is free. How much of a role does technical analysis play in your trading? <laughs> I get hate mail for answering this one. Uh, very little. I mean, sometimes I look at it with, uh, you know, buy and, and sell prices, you know, what kind of trigger, but I find TA to be largely descriptive, not so predictive. I find it to be backward looking. You're looking at how patterns have held. And that's great, as long as that reason for that pattern holds. But if something changes in the market, then that pattern that looked really solid before no longer offers great guidance. Examples of this are, are like the, the platinum sector. People look at platinum or, or had for years looked at platinum and said and argued based on technicals. Now oversold it is that platinum has to go up. And that I've been I've been hearing that for 15 years, Lee, and it hasn't gone anywhere because platinum, the use case changed. What used to be 
the case is no longer the case in, in how platinum is used. It is an industrial metal and palladium made its lunch. And people are saying, oh, well, palladium got expensive. So now they'll go back to platinum. Maybe some substitution will happen there. But I understand from engineers who have a lot more knowledge than me on this, that actually it's it's not it's not so easy to substitute it. And they work at different temperatures. There's been a lot of work done on the palladium catalytic converters, and they are just better actually than the platinum ones in certain applications. And you also have to re-engineer where you put these things on the engine. So your whole production line changes, not just the manufacturing of the catalytic converter itself. So anyway, the point is that changed. And what had seemed like solid technical setups before it just kept failing. And that sort of thing makes me reluctant to rely too much. And the other thing is, Every time I found a new TA guru who seemed to really be dialed in and getting things right, and I, over my years, you know, and particularly back in my Casey days, there would be somebody or others say, oh, well, all this confluence of factors, you know, we think the market's going to melt down, and, you know, the next big crash is coming. And then it wouldn't happen. I've just been disappointed so many times right. that, uh, right. you know, I, I, I take it under advisement. You know, I do look at charts. If there's a, you know, an upward trend like uranium right now, it's two steps forward, one step back. It's in a pretty solid upward trend that you have upward trend lines, lower trend lines. And I do find that interesting and helpful. And it would alarm me much more if uranium were to punch through the lower trend line on right, that right. upward trend. So I do look at things like that. At the end of the day, I'm a fundamentalist and I'm happy to see the technicals agreeing with the fundamentals on uranium. And that is part of why I went long when I did and why I'm not worried about the correction now. I'm looking at the charts now. I, I'm big into TA and it, it looks like we're kind of bottoming here on the on the silver and the gold charts, at least um, I'm looking right now. What, what kind of role does macro play in, into your outlook with not not just not just macro with commodities but you know the equity markets crypto markets does that play any role in your analysis yeah i look at that a lot and all the time but it's it's one of those things where it's an input and you, and you have to have humility in this space you have to take everything with a grain of salt right. i mean I, I love doug casey but he's been predicting the greater depression since 1979 you know that he he's eventually going to be right you know he may be right that it has actually started now it's just disguised by the inflation. You know, once bitten, twice shy. I, there's, there's been several times over the years that I've drank the Kool-Aid. I've been sure. And, you know, after the crash of 2008, I just did not see how the powers that be could kick that can down the road. Things were breaking left and right. You could hear the shattering noises, you know, off and off, off and on Wall Street. That's usually the, the time to it, buy, isn't it? You know, and uh, well, so we made a lot of money, actually. You know, we the crash of 2008 that took gold down to 700 and change. It ended the year in the black. And, and so we bought that dip. I personally bought that dip. So what not paralyzing, but I did not expect what happened next. I, you know, I, I did not expect the economy to get reflated again. And so now we have even more insanity on the macro scale. And it just seems inconceivable, inconceivable. Let me put it this way. As a, as a lifelong libertarian, I knew, or I thought I knew that the Soviet system couldn't work and that the Soviet Union had to collapse and just kept not collapsing and not collapsing for years and years and years, decades right? The, 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 the thing lasted 70 years officially plus on an economic system that was totally backwards, totally turning economic incentives on their head. And so by the time the Berlin Wall came down, I like many in the audience, I you probably remember exactly where you were when you heard the news. I was, I was driving and I had to pull over. It was one of those tearful moments where, you know, finally I've proven right. <laughs> <laughs> it really happened. I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime. You know, I've, I've, I've had a somewhat similar experience, Lobo, because I, I started following this in the late 1990s. And, you know, it's pretty much been the same arguments, bullish case, precious metals. Now, now that said, they have gone up tremendously. And, you, and if you bought them back then, you've done pretty well. But yeah. the catastrophic event has not yet happened. Although to me, it looks like it's closer than ever. It does. And so uh, many rabbits holes here we can go down. What I'm saying is my macro view is pretty scary. I'm very bearish. I, the global economy... <laughs> You know, we don't even know yet how many things broke in the dark in the night when the governments shut down the engine of the world last year. And to think that it can all just bounce back the next year and everything will be PT. Never mind whether the next variant is more dangerous. And, and by the way, I'm of the view that right now, based on the data available, it looks like Omicron is much more contagious much less dangerous, that combination could be the end of the whole thing, right? That, that becomes natural immunity potentially all around the world at much higher level, you know, whether people want to get vaccinated 
it or not, you know, the, the R value in South Africa is over 2.5. Basically, everybody's going to get this. And, and if it's more flu-like, very few people die. And if, if we go into the endemic phase, I think that'd be fantastic news. Maybe that's the end of the whole COVID-19. You know, the, the question, even before, if that's the question true, remains, will the governments allow natural immunity to occur? Uh, I mean, I don't think Omicron is going to ask governments for permission where it spreads. And I, I, I don't I think they're going to have you know, it. Like, like here in New York, we're having a, a mask mandate again. You know, I mean, they're not going to stop it. I, I, I don't think it'll be effectively. I think oh, everybody. I, I agree with you. I'm not. I'm not going to debate. You know, I'm, I'm just saying governments just seem to really like to seize yes. opportunity like this. But, okay, but so at some point though, if the data says COVID-19 has become the next form of the flu, it's done. Right. right? At some point, they're not going to get know, away. That with it has to assert it. itself on policy. What I'm saying though is that even if and when that happens, we're still going to have to deal with all the knock-on effects from all the shutdowns and all that's been done already. And I don't think that's done. And I think and maybe I'm wrong, but I think even if you know the good news gets everybody so excited, people are so positive, woohoo, COVID-19 is over, party time. Yeah, you'll see a, a quick, sharp you know, response to that. You'll see positive economic response to that. But then the longer-term effects come back into play and we see how much damage really has been done. Nobody knows. I'm not saying I know. Nobody. I'm no, saying we're in no, uncharted no, waters. No, there's, nobody there's knows. There's no way you can. There's just absolutely no way you can. And yet Wall Street reacts like they know. And by the way, so I don't know when this is going to go live. We're talking the day before the FOMC press release. The If there's one takeaway I can give the audience, <laughs> you know, think about this. Like all the talking heads on financial media, they're all talking about how hawkish the Fed has been and how... We know, they don't just say, oh, we think the Fed is going to be more alone. We know the head, the Fed has made this hawkish pivot. And now, you know, how hawkish is it going to be all this? It's, it's not just a, a predominant feeling. It's like 90%, 95 I don't know what it is. Everybody I watch on CNBC or Fox or CNN, doesn't matter the source. It's all about how hawkish the Fed is. So if the Fed comes out tomorrow and just says, you know what, we're tightening or tapering as expected, we're still tapering. But you know, if they fail in any way to become more super hawkish tomorrow, I think that becomes a shock. The expectation has become so high now right, right. for a hawkish Fed that, that even a mildly hawkish Fed, I think, becomes a shock. It sounds like if you were so, trading stocks, you'd buy the dip here. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not well, I don't trade Wall Street. I know you don't. I'm just, but, you I'm know, just I, and it's not like me to say, oh, here's the short term trade. But for, for whatever it's worth, you know, I my my sense is that the the markets right now are overpricing in a hawkish Fed. Now, what happens if they prove wrong? I mean, that's good for, for me and my metals and mining stocks, mining gold stocks and so on, but I'm already long there. I don't have to change anything. You know, would I go and overnight, you know, you know, buy call options, short-term call options on the S&P no, you're, or the you're Dow? Not do that. That's I, out of your bailiwick. I'm not going to do that, no. but it would be consistent with what I'm saying. You know, if I'm right, I don't know if I'm right. I'm not predicting this. I'm saying my sense is that the, the market's just, crazily oh you know it's it is assuming it is right when nobody knows so jim kramer this morning and he, he was pounding the table saying the fed has to tighten now <laughs> yeah everybody's saying that and, and honestly that does give them wiggle room right with with so much market expectation for hawkishness then that gives them room to try to be a little more hawkish and get some ammo back in their belt you know if right yeah but they're not going to do, they're not going to raise rates tomorrow or, you know, if anything, they might accelerate the taper, but that tapering is not tightening and it's certainly not raising interest rates. So we'll, we'll see, but, but yeah, it, it strikes me as very asymmetrical when the expectations are, when the chorus is so unanimous, the contrarian in me wants to play that. No course. You know, I, I always get very bullish when I see people just getting like crazy bearish on the markets. I'm like, oh, it's time to buy. Yeah, I, I remember a, a few months ago, silver, everyone was like, oh my God, it's dumping. It. And I'm like, I got to buy. So I bought some and it bounced. It, I mean, it, it didn't go up as much as I like, but it almost always does when people are, and, and conversely, when people are like overly bullish on something, you know, you really have to. Well, the, you, you did not take profits during the silver squeeze last year, did you? No, you know what? I, I've just been accumulating silver because I'm with, with silver and gold. I, I'm a long. I, I would have been very surprised if you sold anything when, when silver was just below 30. And, oh, yeah. No, you know, I, I I've been off. I've been just accumulating because from my view, the, the, the World Economic Forum talking about the Great Reset and everything that's going on in the world. I, I just think we're in for just currency mayhem over the next four to five years so I'm, I'm sitting tight in as much precious metals and I, I buy every dip I can yeah so this is 
this is your new channel, so we have perhaps slightly different audiences. It's probably worth me throwing a quick version of that story about, you know, one of the things Doug Casey taught me is that speculating on the stocks is one thing for, for gold in particular, and the metal itself is a completely different proposition. Absolutely. I would put silver in there for now at any rate. Bullion is savings. Bullion is wealth protection. Bullion is physical value for which your long has no short, right? And it's, it's completely different from thinking, oh, prices are going higher, so I'm going to buy something that's going to benefit from that. I don't buy bullion because prices are going to go higher. I buy bullion because it's bullion. It's, it's something I can hold in my hand. And, it, and it, I have personally experienced in my life silver coins that I collected as a child, uh, saving my family, feeding my family when I had a huge financial meltdown and all else failed. And I did not make money on those coins. I, I got money that I couldn't have gotten any other way. And, and the funny part of the story is that they were old Mexican silver pesos that had a little bit of silver in them. They were not solid silver. Um, and Mexico and peso had been devalued three or four times with numbers of zeros chopped off. If I had pesos in a bank, right? You know, my, my 1960 peso would be completely worthless. Yeah, of course. But I had a silver peso with a little bit of silver in it. And in 1999, when this meltdown happened to me, I had some of these things and I went to a pawn shop and they gave me one peso for these old silver pesos with a smidgen of silver in them. And I went from there to the to the supermarket and I bought food and I took it home to my family. So that's that's what bullion's for. I, you know, 50 uh, years later I, or 40 years later, I got one peso for a peso. I don't think I could agree with what you just said any more than, than, than I possibly can. Um, in, in fact, a few, few weeks ago, I interviewed someone from Lebanon. It's, it's on the channel, Ali Jahadi, sorry. And he was living through such a crazy banking crisis. And that just reinforced my view that buying precious metals and holding on to physical silver and gold is, is true savings account. And, and it's a lot less risky than putting money in the bank. Right. Yeah. I, I literally do not care if the price goes up and down as far as my bullion or my stacks go. That's not what they're for. Yeah. You know, if the price goes up, that's what I, that, I'm looking at my stocks, not my stacks. And if the price goes down, I'm thinking about, hmm, maybe it's a good time to add to my stacks. Now, now to answer your question, I did sell my, I, I was trading ETFs on, on silver and gold, and I did take profits on those. I mean, but th that's a completely different animal, like you said. And, and once I started going on the Wall Street Silver channel itself, I was uncomfortable owning individual miners. So I, I didn't want to be, uh, you know, like talking about them on air and they pop up and then like I'm benefiting from that. So yeah. The only uh, thing I, I really traded during that time was SLJ and other other ETFs. I, I completely understand. And by the way, I don't know how much time we have here, but you were asking about risk management and we went down several rabbit holes, but I did want to mention another strategy that I have that I think is very powerful and important. I mentioned the success and progress phase. There's another area that um, I like even more, but there are fewer picks in that space. And that is what I, the, is the pre-production sweet spot. Now, I did not coin that phrase. Back in my Casey days, the, the marketing guys called it the golden runway. You may have heard it a bit that way, but it's the time between a construction decision and first pour. And there's a revaluation of a first time mind builder in that phase. And my claim to fame, if I have one in this business is that to my knowledge, I'm the first one to ever quantify that with a pretty rigorous data set uh, with over a hundred examples, less than, less than half a dozen of these happen per year. So a data set pushing 120 examples now is actually a pretty thorough data set. I, I don't know what fraction of the entire universe of first time mind builders that is, but it is a large thing. It's, it's not just a tiny representative sample. No, it, it, it sounds a like a good sample size. So, and that shows that contrary to expectations, you know, Doug and Rick and the people I talked to about this, you know, they 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 thought the revaluation would be small because everybody can see who's building a mine. It's priced in. Turns out it's not. It turns out the average gain from a construction decision to first pour or production, if you're doing concentrate, first plate, if it's copper, is on the order of a double, not a 10 bagger, but on the order of a double. But <laughs> But 95% of the companies that set out to build a mine succeeded doing it. So your odds are much, much better. Right. Yeah. And the, here's the, the, the real sweet spot of the sweet spot is that even in a bear market, the average gain was still 30%. You had a lot more failures and incompletes, but you still had average gain. The overall data set has basically 70% positive endings in the pre-production sweet spot, bear market, bull market, whatever. 70% of these cases between a construction decision and that first pour had some kind of positive outcome for shareholders. So this is, you know, it kind of turns the idea of the wild west crazy business of resource stock speculation on its head, that there's this sweet spot that has both high returns and high probability of success. You know, maybe the more I popularize this idea, the more people 
come into this space, maybe it gets priced out. I don't know. But so far, it still works. And you, you look at companies that go from spending money, you know, literally pouring it in the drill holes in the ground or building a mine to producing money. And it makes sense that there should be a re-rate there. So risk management. This is one of my favorite strategies for managing risk. The, the only problem with it is that there are relatively few of these per year. So if you made yourself, you know, I'm only looking at PPSS plays, you wouldn't have very many investments. So I also look at success and progress or, or growth stories or, or whatever. Uh, I also like royalties. But this pre-production sweet spot, there's a free report on this on the website as well. Uh, you can download it. I don't charge you a penny for it. And it lays out the data and the findings there. And uh, my, my favorite thing about this is that when I told Doug about it, he didn't believe it. We went back, redid the data, doubled the data set. And he was really impressed. When I told Rick about it, he took it to his his bright boys there in, at the Sprott shop and they crunched on it for a while. And, and Rick came back to me and says, I could find no flaw. <laughs> and coming from Rick, I, that was like the highest praise ever. I was he, say he that says, sounds like something Rick would say too. <laughs> yeah, so that that's uh, you know he tells me it's the best piece of work I've done. So I you know that means a lot to me. Hopefully, it'll mean something to the audience. No, I think it will. So, so it sounds to me like you're, most of your risk management strategy is just basically looking at fundamentals and what you think has a high probability of, of working. Do you do anything with technical levels and? In pricing? No. You know, I decide what I want to buy and then I might use the technicals to, to uh, spot an entry price. Or there's, there's something else, um, another free strategy. I call it the upside maximizer. And basically it's a form of using trailing stops, but not as a stop loss, but as a tool to lock in gains. You know, Doug taught me when I first started 2004 uh, in Casey Research, he taught me to sell half on the first double. You know, mining stocks are so volatile, you never know what's going to happen. They could be nationalized or an endangered mosquito could be discovered on the property, you know, and, and so no matter how great a story is going, there is always risk that it can go to zero almost overnight or, or, or go no bid and, and then go to zero and you're basically screwed, you know, so, so don't fall in love with these things. Or as Doug used to say, these are not family heirlooms. They're burning matches. Even the best of them are burning matches. Don't fall in love with them. Don't leave all your money on the table and risk having your big wins slip through your fingers or claws as the case may be. But the problem with, with Tate is selling half on the first double is that, you know, it, it keeps going up and you've already uh, cut your upside on there. And I used to get anguished letters like speculators know they're speculating and people will get mad if we made a recommendation and didn't work out, but that's nothing compared to the fury we would get if we recommended um, what my <laughs> former colleague, Aaron Katusa would call the Casey free ride, you know, take profits. And then it goes on to be a 10 or 20 bagger. And you've cut that in half. The, the, the fury that we got from people right, about right. these lost profits. And I'd always say, well, you know, but you could sleep at night. Isn't that worth something? But no, they were mad as heck. Yeah. And I, I kind of understand it. I mean, you could have made so much money. You, you, you had the position and you, you know, so the upside maximizer is my way of managing risk in this space. The upside risk is I don't sell half on the first double. I let it ride, but I put a trailing stop, a, a special kind of trailing stop that I call an upside maximizer. And I just let it keep going. And then when it does roll up, when the stock is clearly broken, its trend, when it's not just a you know a typical volatility, but something has changed in the story and it's and it's changed. That's when I take my profits. So so here's the thing: like say I sell half on the first double, right? I've got my money back, I have no risk. But it, let's say it's a five bagger when I sell when I take profits. I can get my money back by selling one fifth instead of half. So I can have all my money back, no risk in the play at all, and four times as much money still on the table than I started with. And, and the point is, I, I don't know if it's going to be a five bagger, a 10 bagger, or just a double or a triple. I just, I let it ride. And, and so this was a sideways answer of saying, you know, that's the main technical thing I do is I look at the charts, I look at the data, I look at the typical volatility, and I, and I calculate a, a sort of margin of safety that I'm willing to ride that volatility and then on a big win. And then if it breaches that trigger, then that's when I take profits. And do that you, way you I lost the strategy in. mapped out on your, on your website. Or... I do. That's another free report. Not everything's free. Right. I do have letters for which I charge and I hope people will sign up. Um, but it's called Upside Maximizer. It's on the homepage or you can 
search for Maximizer on our website, you'll find it. It's a, it's a completely free download. So is there anything that you would like to tell or tell the audience? We say on our, our about page, you know, our description that we don't want to insult your intelligence. We want to assume your intelligence. So I don't talk down to people. I don't spam them. I don't hype them. And anybody can say that. But if you sign up for our free weekly digest, you will find that you will get one weekly email. I'm not going to suddenly open the floodgates of daily advertisements and upsell this and buy that. And my friend over here is selling sofas or whatever, you know, you, you get one email per week and that should show you, you know, how I think, how I work, what I do. And if that interests you, I hope you'll do business with me. But if not, I still value you as part of that distribution. It, it helps me with get attention from companies. The bigger my audience, the more power I have with the companies to get my job done. So everybody's welcome. And I just, you know, I hope you'll you'll check it out and see if I walk the walk. Oh, I'm sure you do. I mean, you, you've, you've been at this uh, for, for some time. You've, you've learned a lot and you have a good following, so. All right, well, thank you, Lee. Oh, thank you, Love. I appreciate it. Uh, it was great to talk to you again.